Hello, welcome back to part two of our trip along the Shrewsbury to Newport Canal. As we can see again, we have the side-by-side -side maps courtesy of the National Libraries of Scotland. On the left-hand side, maps from 1885 to 1900 and Google Earth on the right-hand side, which is really, really handy for what we want to be doing here. In the previous video, I was talking about this section here. As you look on the right-hand side, and this is where the canal used to come underneath the railway and across here and down towards Berwick Tunnel. But what wasn't there previously, as we can see on the left-hand side, is the dual carriageway. Now, I was talking about the possibility of being able to reconnect this section of the canal. Had a brief chat with the chairman of the Shrewsbury Newport Canal Trust and he wrote to me and he said, to cross the A5 and railway, we intend to do this by a fall and rise lock system. This will, as you rightly say, be expensive. However, national highways now have to fund the restoration of any heritage asset that the building of trunk roads has damaged or destroyed. And they have already done this for the Cotswold Canal Trust to the tune of four million for a mile of their canal. So this can be done, which is absolutely fantastic news. Another thing that we were talking about was along the back of Attingham Park. So if we just move down here now, on the right hand side I'm just circling over the Attingham Park estate and we were talking about how this section of the canal along here has been restored by the National Trust and there's a good reason for this. The National Trust has been working with both Shropshire Council and Telford and Reekin Council to improve cycle routes to the Attingham Park estate, the third most popular National Trust visitor attraction. They have plans to use the canal towpath which would make a safe flat route into the county town. Whilst there are challenges of the A5 and railway to cross, there is a determination to do this, which is great news. So we'd be able to get from here all the way back, as we were covering in the previous video, into the town itself, which is actually doable currently because if we just scoot back up here, follow the, uh, the route of the canal, and we come across here, and this is where the canal goes under what is now the A49. And this route here along the towpath is a national cycle route. So by the looks of it, the plan is to join it all up and make it a nice route that people can cycle along, which is great news. And to add a little bit more information into what we were talking in the previous video, we're here now at the Flax Mill. If we look on the right hand side, this is where the path of the canal used to run, as you can see, as it's moving over on the left hand side. I showed you an up-to-date picture of what we have there now and it was showing very clearly where the canal bed was. So the information has come to me that says the, the canal along the flax mill. There is outline planning permission in place to build houses along the Ditherington Road. This will partly recoup the £22 million it has cost for the restoration of the buildings. There is no funding as yet for the rewatering of the canal. However, the line of the canal has been cleared of contaminated soil and will be grassed over and not built on. When planning permission is granted to the developer of the housing, our trust will be pressing Shropshire Council to make it a condition of the planning permission that the canal is rewatered, which would be absolutely brilliant. Right then, we shall now carry on our trip up the canal. So, as we were saying here, we go underneath of the railway line and we start to move our way up to Withington. But what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to swap the map. The reason I've done this is because I have been looking around and on this map from 1888 to 1913, this is stating the types of bridges, be it a swing bridge or a draw bridge, which I wasn't aware of until I was having a play around with this recently. So if we just come back down here, right, here we are. So we've gone through here, which is now the dual carriageway, and we go underneath the railway line. And then we're moving our way up to Withington. As well as the hedge line, if you're down in this part here where the canal was running, the canal bed is all still there. Not filled anymore, but it's very, very clear to see. And then as we're working our way up here on the left hand side, we can see very clearly the canal. And then on the right here, very, very distinct 
tree line where the canal will have run through previously. Then we come across to what would have been a bridge on this, what looks like a driveway down to this property down here. As we move a little bit further along, we come to where there will have been a swing bridge. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any information on this bridge or what it looked like, so I can't pop any pictures in here, which is a bit of a shame. So we'll just carry along this section here. If we look on the left-hand side, we're coming up to what looks like there may have been a wharf here of some description, but I'm not too sure on that one, so I will have to look into that one further. I'm just gonna pause the video now, simply because since I made this, I have since had an update as to what I was saying was perhaps a wharf, and it's not a wharf. What it is, is called a winding hole, and it's spelt winding hole, but what it's actually for is for when you're bringing tugboats down the canal in order to be able to turn them around. When you think about it, the canal's not that wide, and if you've got a very, very long boat, you can't do a U-turn effectively. So these are strategically placed along the canal, and we'll notice that further on, and they're called winding holes, and the reason they're called winding holes is because they used to use the horse to pull the front of the boat across via rope and the wind would then push the back of the boat around. So effectively, this is a turning circle. So if you were coming down this section of the canal here and you needed to turn around for some reason, whether you're going into one of the, the many warehouses which were dotted along the canal, then you could then pull your boat back up because you were able to turn it around and go back up. On a railway line, you have a turntable. On a canal, you have these winding holes. And here we have an example of a winding hole, and this is located on the Worcester and Birmingham Canal. Then we go into the field here, and again, as the farms have worked these lands, the canal has disappeared, but we can see a bit of an earth line through it as I move the cursor on the right hand side where it seems to be a bit of a line there is also on the left hand side we can see that, that is where the canal was running formerly and then we approach Withington and it starts to bear around to the right here along this hedge line as we move along this hedge line here, if we just zoom in slightly on the left hand side, we can see that it's marked there with a drawbridge. As far as I can see, all of that has long since gone. Then we move a little bit further along and around as it starts to turn towards the left. It runs behind the church, which is still in place, as we can see on the right hand side. And then where these properties are now, it would then go through here where there's a little bridge and we have some photographs of this bridge so we'll just drop down and have a look at those now and there's the church on the right hand side this time because we're looking back towards Shrewsbury in this picture and as you can see just over the canal there we have one of the lift bridges one of the many lift bridges that were used on this part of the canal unfortunately like with many parts of the canal there's no trace of this left now which is a real shame but as I'm sure we can all agree from this picture, this really does demonstrate quite how pretty the route of this canal was. So as we move a little bit further on up from the church, we come across another bridge, and this is where the canal goes underneath of the road. So if we just drop down into Google Earth, this is the bridge as it is now. So if we just span to the right, we can see there's new houses that have gone up. But if we just move down here, jumping over the bridge. This is looking back towards Shrewsbury. Over here in the distance is the church. So the lift bridge would have been around about here, but as we'll be able to see when we go back into the side-by-side -side view, if we just move down slightly on the right-hand side, if we look, um, we have the, the church here and we have the line of the canal. If we follow it on the left, it's going through where some of these properties have been built. This is the section on the right hand side. This is where we've just had a look at where the, the bridge is and the canal, as you can see, is then moving up this way towards Longdon on Turn. But I have a photo that I will just pop in here that was taken in 1998. So we'll just take a quick look at that now. 
So this is the picture I was just referring to. Uh, this is a view from Withington Bridge facing down towards the church and it was taken in 1998 by Tony Clayton. And what we can see is here that none of the properties were built at that point. So we can see a nice straight run down towards the church. Slightly in the distance would have been where the little lift bridge uh, was formerly. So as a point of reference where we were just looking on Google Earth, this is the same place and this is what would have been seen back in 1998. So as we start to move our way out of Withington, we then you can see on the right hand side, we cross the road again here. There would have been another bridge here. I have just had a look on Google Earth. There's no sign of that now, but we will just drop down and have a quick look. Here we are again on Google Earth. As I was saying previously, this site here uh, that I'm just moving the cursor over is the site of where the former bridge was. If we look just over into the distance, that is the path of the canal coming around here. It would have gone under the road. And as we just turn around here, it then would have gone along here following the tree line that we could see quite distinctly from Google Earth. But as we pan all the way around, we can see quite clearly there are no signs of the previous structure that once stood here. As you could see from the previous video there, as we look into this field here, if we look on the right hand side, there's no sign of the canal as the field has been worked. So as we start to move our way up here, like I said, there's no sign of the canal other than a very distinct hedge line and tree line. And we'll move around here. And as we come across this road here, we can see on the left hand side, it states that there was another drawbridge there. So I suspect at that time, the road wouldn't have been such a heavily used road, as now we can see that this road is clearly used for regular commuting. So as we come across here again, we see on the left hand side, the line of the canal, but again in the field, there's no sign of it, other than the fact that on the right hand side, you can slightly see an earth line which still remains in that field on the approach into Roddington. Okay, as we approach Roddington now, we can see that we're leaving the field and on the left hand side you can see the canal is following the path of the road which is still there. As the canal comes round on the right hand side, we go over a bridge just before we get to what has been marked as the old clay pit. And we'll just drop down into Google Street View, one of our favorite things, so that we can see this is the bridge we're referring to just there, which is still in place. Canal would have come along here and then run off this way towards the aqueduct. So the canal would have then come underneath this bridge that we were just looking at, moved along this section of the canal here, past the old clay pit, and then on towards Roddington Aqueduct. And this aqueduct was built to cross the River Roden. And we'll just have a look at some photographs of what was previously there. This aqueduct was designed by Josiah Close, and he was the engineer of the Shrewsbury Canal from 1793 until his death in 1795. Unfortunately, this lovely aqueduct was demolished in 1971. This is a great picture of Josiah Close aqueduct over the River Roden at Roddington. As you can see in the picture there, the canal is running off into the distance up towards Longdon on Turn. And just make a note of the buttresses and the design of this aqueduct, because where we're about to go to very shortly, we'll see some very, very distinct similarities. But it really was a great shame that this was demolished in the, in the early 70s. As we move away from the aqueduct, we now move into this section here. On the right hand side we can see very clearly that there's a very very thick tree line here. On the left hand side what we can see is these markings to the side of the canal and they're denoting that this was a raised section. So embankments were built up and the canal cut into the centre of it and as it moved further on down here and this is when we move off again into the field where it has been lost. But just moving back here a little bit there isn't, it's not marked here. However, on the left hand side, we can just see this little mark here. And that's showing us that there was a tunnel under the canal there. And we know that that was there because we can still see it today. As we go back into Google Street View, this is the road that's approaching the canal. The canal is in this section over here. 
this is the raised embankment that I was just talking about. So if we just drop down here a little bit, we can start to see it. And here it is, still in place. And we can also see that the embankments are all still here, very overgrown now, but still in place nevertheless. If we move a little bit further up here, we can see that the terrain is starting to level out. And as we move further on, this is the field over here that the canal will have run out of, come through the embankment here and down into this field and run across here. But we'll carry on having a look at that with the side-by-side -side view where we can have a much better look. Before we move on, I've got a slight update to add here. I'll just make this quick. This section here we were just talking about, which is the raised embankment. There's a work party that are now working on this. They're clearing the towpath. So it'll be very much like the approach to Berwick Tunnel, which has been previously been really badly overgrown, but now it is being cleared so that the towpath will be accessible and you'll be able to walk all the way down this section of the canal because the canal bed is still in place. Also, I said just before we move on, there's a drawbridge here. Since that work to clear everything has been going on, they've discovered the stonework that was originally used for the bridge itself. So I'll have to get out and I'll have to pop some pictures in later on. Back here in the side-by-side -side view, we can see as we move away from the embankment here, it's showing us that there was another drawbridge which would have been situated around about here in this field. So if we just move up a little bit now, as we're moving away from Roddington on the way to Longdon on Turn, and in this field here, it's showing that there would have been another drawbridge. I assume looking at the map on the left-hand side that this would have been simply to connect fields so that it was easier to get around them because of the canal cutting right through here. And as we come along here, it's showing us that there was another drawbridge just here on this road here. Then we move into this field here where we can actually see on this side there is an earth line that we can see on the right-hand side here. Then as we move up, we pick up a hedge line here, which was the former route of the canal. And then we move up over here where it's showing us there was another drawbridge. And again, we're back into fields. There's not an awful lot that you can see on the right-hand side here. But as we come up towards Longdon on Turn, we can start to pick up the canal. And it's very, very clear on the right-hand side, the sweep of the canal as it moves towards the aqueduct here. What we can also see is, as we move around here, if we look on the left-hand side, it's showing us that there was another embankment. And that's because of the land is falling away down towards the river. And this is the river turn. So there's another embankment here, and then that ran straight into this cast iron aqueduct and across and away into this field. These embankments have been virtually taken away now. As you approach from this road here up towards the aqueduct. There's a slight raise in the land, but as these are fields which are being worked, naturally they've been ploughed away, but you can still just about see it as you walk up towards the aqueduct. So as I just mentioned, we're moving down towards the aqueduct, and here it is. This is the aqueduct at Longdon on Turn, the cast iron aqueduct, and it was re-engineered by Thomas Telford after the first construction by Josia Close was swept away by floods. It was built in 1796 to carry the canal across the River Turn. It's 186 feet long, it's 9 feet wide, and the water depth was 3 feet. Now, when I mentioned the width, that 9 feet also includes a towpath. But we shall have a good look at this because it's a really, really interesting feature on this canal. We'll start with a bit of background information on this aqueduct here. As you can see in this photo, there's two types of aqueduct. We've got the brick section on the right hand side and then we have the cast iron trough on the left hand side. And there's a reason for this. The original structure which was designed by Josiah Close was supposed to carry the canal all the way across the River Turn. And as I said previously when we were at Roddington, if you take a look at that aqueduct, you'll see that they were supposed to be virtually identical. But late in 1794, Josiah Close unfortunately died. He was buried on the 1st of January, 1795. And what took place a couple of months later changed this aqueduct. Between the 10th and the 12th of February in 1795, there was some abnormal flooding in the area. 
and this aqueduct still under construction, the centre sections were washed away. On the 28th of February of 1795, Thomas Telford was appointed the chief engineer of the Shrewsbury Canal. Previously to that, he was then the Shropshire County Surveyor. And he decided that using a cast iron trough that we have here now was going to be a lot faster and a lot cheaper to get the canal across the River Turn. Cost-wise, this made absolute sense, as he was given a budget that wasn't to exceed any more than £2,000, which is roughly around about £246,000 in today's money. By mid-March in 1795, the plans for this aqueduct in cast iron were approved. The cast iron itself came from Ketley Ironworks, not too far away, and with it being cast iron, it's extremely strong and extremely durable, and because of the nature of its construction, required a lot less support. Each cast iron pier is set on a masonry base and consists of a pair of slender three-legged cruciform sections, one vertical and two inclined, with a plain diagonal cross brace between. In the early 1970s, the aqueduct was classified as a grade one listed structure. So in this picture here, I'm standing on the towpath of the aqueduct. On the left hand side, we can see inside the trough. If you look, you can see some small holes which are cut into the base of the trough itself. And these are drain holes and you find these every so often along the span of this aqueduct. You can also see the sides of the trough. This was built in sections. So of course, when these go together, they have to be sealed. So somebody very cleverly came up with the idea of using Welsh flannel, which was dipped in boiling sugar and ox blood, then dipped in lead, and then placed between the two sections, bolted together, and that gave a watertight seal, which still works today. And we can see that on other cast iron aqueducts. Before we go and have a look at another cast iron aqueduct, I've got a great story which I just need to add in here. Sometime in the 1970s, the local fire brigade had a new pump that they needed to test. So they decided to reflood the aqueduct. They put the bungs in the drain holes and blocked up both ends. And when they filled the aqueduct up, they discovered that it was still completely watertight. And here is another aqueduct, which as you can see from the pictures, is almost identical to the one which we're looking at at Longdon on turn. Except with this one, they made some slight differences and I'll go into those reasons very shortly. But as you can see from the design on the side of this aqueduct, it is almost identical to Longdon on turn and they used that same system to seal this aqueduct and it's still holding water today. This one here again was designed by Thomas Telford and it was built just after the aqueduct at Longdon on turn was constructed. It's located at Poncasete. That's my best attempt at pronouncing it. So please don't laugh at me. And they made some changes to this aqueduct for reasons that I'll go into now. One of the biggest changes was that the actual trough itself was a lot wider. This one was actually nine feet wide. Because what they discovered at Longdon on Turn was when they were pulling tugboats across the aqueduct, there wasn't really enough space to displace the water. And this made it harder to draw the boats across. So what they did with this one was elevate the towpath and allow the water to disperse underneath the towpath. So this picture here demonstrates the difference. As we can see, the towpath is elevated and that allows more disbursement of water as the canal boats are coming along. We can also see in this picture that this is when routine maintenance was being performed on the aqueduct and it had been drained. And in the picture there is the actual drain plug itself. Back here at Longdon on Turn now, and I'm just taking the drone across the aqueduct and we're heading towards Longdon on Turn itself. And just as we come off of the, the aqueduct, this is where there would have been an embankment section. As you can see, there's no trace of it now. But when we look at this side, to the left hand side as the canal exits into the field, you can still see that there is a slightly raised section. But like I said previously, this field is still worked, so the majority of it has been taken away. But there is some signs that there was an embankment there previously. As we move from Telford section here, we go through Josiah Clough's original structure, and then to the left and the right, we can see what remains of the embankment. Okay, so back up in the air now. 
and we're just going to move away from Longdon on Turn. So here on the right hand side we're showing the aqueduct. This section here you can see on the left hand side it's showing that there was a raised section, an embankment all the way down here to carry the canal through this field. And just if I just move the cursor on the right hand side over these sections here we can see where the embankment was taken down and sort of put back towards ground level. There is, like we just showed you, there is some, uh, some slight raised sections that you can see, but nothing as it would have been. So we'll move on down here. And just as this section here, there is a stream and the canal again would have had to have crossed this. And we move back up here to where there would have been another embankment. And on the right hand side, we can't really see very much here because of the trees. But on the left here, we were saying it's showing that this was formerly a weir. And here we have another drawbridge and another embankment. Uh, this is quite interesting because this is where we'll get to see in the field the line or the earth line that remains. So if we just keep our eye on the left hand side, we move into the field and just as we get into this darker section of the field here, and across to this greener one that we can see on the right, we can see very, very clearly that the canal is visible from the air. Although when you're at ground level, there isn't anything because all of this section is built up in an embankment. So we cross what would have been a railway line here, and this would again would have gone underneath, and then we get to this section here which on the right hand side we can see very clearly is still there and still within water. And this area is called Sleepford. And this is where the canal came straight through here, straight across. And again, in the field, because there's an embankment section here again, we can still see very, very clearly an earth line. And once we're in this field here, this is where we get to Iton Lower Lock number 11. And with thanks to Tony Clayton, we have some more photos from the 1970s so that we can have a look at what it was like back then. Unfortunately, access is quite difficult, so we can't get any up-to-date photos currently. Here we are at Iton Lower Lock. In this picture, we can see the guillotine gates that were used on the exit of the lock as you're heading towards Shrewsbury. In the photo, we can also see Domino the dog. And this photo was taken in 1972 by Tony Clayton. The lifting mechanism used here is the original Type A, with wheel and axle lifting gear and a counterbalance over the tail bay. As you can see from the picture, the counterbalance has started to collapse and from this picture it's become evident that the weight of the gate had pulled down the lifting mechanism. This lock was also widened when the Newport branch was built, joining the canal to the national network. This is the superstructure of the guillotine gate at Iton Lock. This photo was taken in 1978, and sadly this collapsed in the early 1980s. Here we have the winch system that was used on the bottom gate. This photo was taken in 1977, and we can see from this picture that this is looking into the lock itself. The photo that we're looking at now isn't actually from Iton Lower Lock itself. This is from the next lock up, which is Iton Village Lock, and we'll be covering that shortly. I've put this picture in here because I think it's worth pointing out as this is the first lock that we've come to on the canal. So what we need to show here is that these locks had two types of gates and this was on all of the locks. So as you're entering the lock and in this direction we'd be coming from Telford going towards Shrewsbury and you'd go through this first gate which was a swing gate then you'd move into the lock itself and at the bottom you then had the guillotine gates. But like I say, I think it's worth just putting this piece of information as this is the first one that we've come to. Okay, so back up in the air. We'll move away from Iton Lower Lock and we'll move upstream towards Iton Village Lock, which is just here. But just before we go, I'll just point out that this here, you can notice on the left-hand side, wasn't there. This was a storm drain which was put in in the mid 1970s. Then we'll move a little bit further on up here. And like I say, we come to Iton Village Lock. So we just move in a little bit here. 
Now we'll drop down onto Google Street View so we can see what it looks like from there. But I've also had the drone out, so I've got some nice shots of it that I've taken and I'm flying all the way along here across the top of the lock and back out. So we'll have a look at those now. Okay, so here we are at Eton Village Lock. That is just in front of us. On the left-hand side there is the Keeper's Cottage. So if we just move a little bit forward, we can see in the middle here, this is where the drawbridge would have been. And if we just jump forward here and turn, we can see that we have the remains of the lock system. Now it's not too clear here if I zoom in because it does pixelate a little bit. But just here is what they've now put in is a weir, because obviously this is still a running brook. This is the Hurley Brook. This is an image that was taken from 2011. And if we just turn around here, we can see this over here, this is where it runs out. So this side here has been covered over. But what we can also see, as I said before, is where the lift bridge would have been. If we just move over here, and we can see that section just there. But I've also had the drone out, so we can have a look at it from the air. And we've got some quite nice photos of which have been taken in the last few weeks. And the current date at the moment is May 2022. So here we are moving down towards Eton Village Lock. The direction of travel here is as if we were moving towards Shrewsbury. And just in front of the lock, we can see the bridge which now goes across the road. As I said before, this would have been a lift bridge. And as we'll see very shortly, this area is in so much better condition than it was 40 years ago. It really has been restored nicely. All the locks on this canal were designed originally to take four 20 foot by six foot tub boats and to conserve water had guillotine gates at the lower end. The original intention was to have an intermediate gate 20 feet from one end so that when a single boat passed through only a quarter of the water was required. Locks four and six have grooves below the original water line just over 20 feet from the top gate sill whilst locks 10 and 11 have vertical columns of brick at this position. So basically what we can see from this picture is the guillotine lock itself and that gate is cut into the walls as I was referring to as the grooves. So as just one boat would pass through the lock, they'd only have to operate one part of that lock as opposed to the entire lock system, which would have made it use a lot less water. I was saying before about the condition of what we can see today. And as we can see from these couple of pictures in the 1970s, it really was in quite a bad state of disrepair. We can see now quite clearly at the end of the lock system there, that is the weir that was put in in the 1970s. And we'll just move along the length of the lock itself. Bear in mind, in order to be able to have four 20-foot boats in there, it had to be a decent length, which we can see from this now as we pan around. And as we move a bit further down, we'll be able to see the channels that the original guillotine gates sat in. Now I understand that when the guillotine gates were removed, they were taken away and they were put into a museum in London. Whether they're still on show anywhere, I really don't know. But if anybody does know, please feel free to let me know in the comments down below. There we can see the grooves just below us now. And as we move towards what would have been the lift bridge, we can see how different it is. One more piece of information about this lock. During its construction, it was made a foot deeper than all of the other locks on the canal. And this was simply because there's a water mill to the right hand side, or there was a water mill to the right hand side on this picture. It's actually shown on the maps that we've been looking at. It was made a foot deeper so they could have more water into it and it was channeled away and used when the water mill was required. I found that out recently and I thought it was important to put that piece of information into it now. We'll finish this episode now. And we can see on this flight that we're moving back towards Eyton Lock. And this would be the direction of travel as if we were coming from Shrewsbury. But further on up is when we will get to Wappenshaw Junction. And we've got quite a lot to cover at Wappenshaw Junction. So do look out for that episode. It really should be very interesting as a lot of work has gone on there, which has been done by the volunteers of the Shrewsbury Newport Canal Trust. 
I will leave all the information for the Shrewsbury and Newport Canal Trust in the description and there'll be links to the website. So please do go along and have a look because the work that these people are doing in order to get this canal operational again is absolutely remarkable. Thanks very much for watching. It's really appreciated. If there is any information or anything that you think I've missed or you'd like to know, please do leave a comment and I will do my very best to find out the relevant information and come back to you. But as we can just see as we're flying along here, as the camera starts to pan up, there's a building in the distance and that is Wappenshaw Junction. So we shall start there next time. And like I said, there's an awful lot of information coming from that place that we need to cover.